to Clinical Anatomy for PA students. Today we'll continue our discussion of the abdomen and move down into the pelvis. We'll start by talking about the kidneys. The left and right kidneys are both located retroperitoneally. And the retroperitoneal space, meaning they're located back posterior to the peritoneal cavity or posterior to the peritoneum. Um, the kidneys are located between the T12 and L3 vertebrae, which you can see over here. The posterior surface of the kidney lies on the posterior abdominal wall on either side of the vertebral column. Looking at the kidneys, you can see that the right kidney is slightly lower than the left kidney. This is just because the liver sits on the right side and the right lobe of the liver is relatively large compared to the structures on the left. The medial margin of the kidney is concave, while the lateral margin is convex. And this is what gives it this kidney bean type shape that we're used to seeing. The medial margin of the kidney has the renal hilum, which is a vertical cleft or a vertical slit that opens and provides entry into the space within the kidney. The space within the kidney is referred to as the renal sinus. The renal sinus is mostly filled with fat and then embedded in the fat, we have the renal pelvis, the funnel shaped opening that connects to the ureter. We have the renal artery and the renal vein. When we look at these structures, um, they're organized from anterior to posterior or from the front to the back. We have the renal vein and then entering behind it, the renal artery, and then entering in the very back is the renal pelvis. If you look at the picture right here, you can see the kidneys. This is the right kidney on this side. And then over here is the left kidney. We're looking at this from the back. This is a posterior view. So left and right are your left and right. So you can see that the right kidney is slightly lower than the left. Again, that's just because the liver sits right on top of that right kidney. When you look at the kidneys, you can see that they extend from T12 down to about the level of L3 on either side of the vertebral column. You can see the medial surface is where we have the hilum where structures enter. This funnel shaped structure that you're looking at right there is the renal pelvis. And then you can see that it connects to the ureter, the tube that leads down towards the bladder. Looking at this structure here, um, from the front or anterior view, you can see that first the renal vein goes into the hilum. Just posterior to that is the renal artery. And then posterior to that is the renal pelvis connecting to the ureter. Again, this indented area right here is the renal hilum. And there's a slit-like opening that goes into the internal tissue of the kidney. Um, looking over here, you can actually see the renal sinus better um, and the renal hilum. Again, the hilum is this, this vertical opening that we have right here. And then all of this space in here, all of this open area is the renal sinus. You can see how the renal vein passes in and goes through the renal sinus as it makes its way out towards the actual um, cortical tissue, the tissue of the kidney. And then you can see again, posterior to that is the renal artery and in the very back, the renal pelvis. Superiorly, the diaphragm separates the kidneys from the pleural cavities and the 12th ribs. When we look at the right kidney, we see that the liver the duodenum, the ascending colon are all anterior to the right kidney, just depending on which level of the kidney you're looking at. Looking at the left kidney, the stomach, spleen, pancreas, jejunum, and descending colon can all possibly be anterior to the left kidney. Um, looking at this transverse plane that cuts through at this level right here, you can see on this side, this is the right kidney. And anterior to it, we have the liver. 
over here is the left kidney. You can see that it's related to the spleen right here, the large intestine, small intestine, and then you see the pancreas right here. The ureters are the muscular ducts or tubes that carry urine from the kidneys down to the bladder. So there's a left ureter and a right ureter. The abdominal part of the ureter is also located in the retroperitoneal space, just like the kidney is. And the ureters adhere closely to the posterior aspect of the parietal peritoneum. So they're just behind the peritoneum and they follow the posterior aspect of the peritoneum as they descend down towards the pelvis. The superior most portion of the ureter is referred to as the renal pelvis. If you look here up at this picture, you see the thin tube is the ureter and then it expands at its proximal region into this large funnel shaped structure. That large funnel shaped structure is the renal pelvis. The renal pelvis is formed from the merging of two to three structures that are referred to as major calyces, or just one would be a major calyx. So we have a major calyx over here and a major calyx over here. Those come together to form the renal pelvis. Each of these major calyces is formed from the merging of two or three minor calyces, just smaller little cup-shaped funnels. So this is a minor calyx. This is a minor calyx, a minor calyx. Each of these minor calyces, again, is a little cup-shaped funnel that sits at the apex or the point of each renal pyramid. That apex or point is referred to as the renal papilla or papilla. So we'll start our way out here at the pyramids and work our way down. This is the renal pyramid and the little point at the end is the renal papilla, that apex. The urine is collected through the pyramid and empties into this first little funnel. This first little cup-shaped funnel that collects urine from one pyramid is a minor calyx. You see that the minor calyces merge together and they form a major calyx. And then we have multiple major calyces come together to form the renal pelvis. These are just funnels, connective tissue fibrous funnels that get larger and larger and larger as they collect urine and bring that urine towards the ureter where it will then exit the kidney. Down here you can see an actual kidney. So the hilum is this vertical slit like opening into the kidney and you can see this this kind of white yellow tissue is showing you all of these calyces that are coming together to form the renal pelvis and then the renal pelvis is leading to the ureter. The ureters descend inferomedially from the kidneys towards the bladder. So they descend down and they slowly head in towards the bladder, which is located centrally down in the pelvis. As the ureters descend, they pass anterior to the psoas major, the muscle that you see right here, and right here. And they go down just across the, um, the lateral tips of the transverse processes of the lumbar vertebrae. The ureters cross medially just inferior to the bifurcation of the common iliac artery, which you can see occurs right here and right here. The common iliac artery bifurcates or splits into an external iliac and an internal iliac. Right after that bifurcation or just inferior to that split is where the ureters will curve in to go in towards the medial line or towards the center of the body. Where we see that the ureters enter into the bladder 
they cross through the bladder wall or the detrusor muscle at an oblique angle. This oblique angle acts as a valve and the valve only allows the urine to flow in one direction. The urine can go from the ureters into the bladder, but because of the angle that the ureters cross through the detrusor or the wall of the bladder, the angle prevents the retrograde flow or backflow of urine from the bladder up into the ureters. The openings of the ureters into the bladder are referred to as the ureteral orifices or the ureteric orifices. When we look at the ureters and the way that they descend down from the kidneys into the bladder, there are three places that are constricted that are common sites of obstruction with things like kidney stones. The first constricted area is at the junction between the ureter and the renal pelvis. So right around this area here is the initial area where stones will get stuck. Also at the brim of the pelvic inlet, the brim of the pelvic inlet is right where we see the ureter cross over the common iliac artery or the, just under the bifurcation of the common iliac artery. Also at the area where the ureter passes through the wall of the bladder. Looking over here, highlighted in green, you can see the ureters. Again, coming down over the psoas major. They cross over the iliac arteries and veins and travel down the lateral wall of the pelvis before crossing into the bladder, again, at an oblique angle, back at the posterior wall of the bladder. Here again, we can see the ureters coming down the posterior, let me change color, sorry. You can see the ureters coming down along the posterior abdominal wall crossing over the external iliac artery right after the bifurcation of the common iliac, descending down the lateral wall of the pelvis and then into the back of the bladder. Notice right here, these vessels that are crossing over the top of the ureters, these are the testicular and ovarian arteries and veins. And you'll see on both sides, they cross right over um, the top of the ureter. Over here, we can see the three constriction points where obstruction of the ureter occurs. The first constriction, again, is right where the ureter meets with the renal pelvis at that pelvic ureteric junction. Our second constriction point is at the pelvic brim again, where the ureter crosses over the iliacs. And then our third constriction point is where the ureter crosses through the bladder wall into the bladder. The suprarenal glands, or they're also called adrenal glands, are located on the top of each kidney. They're located between or sandwiched between the superomedial or top and medial edge of the kidney and the diaphragm. The two adrenal glands or suprarenal glands are structured or um, shaped slightly differently from each other. The right suprarenal gland is more pyramid shaped. It's in contact with the inferior vena cava, anteromedially, and then the liver anterolaterally. The left suprarenal gland is more crescent shaped. It's related to the spleen, stomach, as well as the pancreas. The suprarenal glands are surrounded in, con in connective tissue that contains ample adipose tissue or fat, and that gives it the fatty appearance when we look at it from the outside. 
They're enclosed by the renal fascia, which actually extends up superiorly and connects to the diaphragm. But their adrenal glands are separated from the kidney by fibrous tissue. The adrenal glands or suprarenal glands have two regions. The suprarenal cortex is the outer region. And this outer region, this cortex, produces hormones that we classify as corticosteroids. steroids because that's the classification of hormone that they are. Um, they're lipid derivative hormones. Cortico because they're coming from the cortex. Um, this includes things like um, the glucocorticoids, such as cortisol, um, aldosterone, as well as androgens like testosterone. The suprarenal medulla or adrenal medulla is the inner region of the gland and this inner region releases epinephrine and norepinephrine into the bloodstream. So it's releasing them as hormones that travel through the bloodstream so that there's more of a systemic effect. And it does this in response to sympathetic stimulation. Here you guys can see the adrenal glands. Again, they sit on top of each kidney. Here we see the right adrenal gland or suprarenal gland. This is the one that's more pyramid shaped. And again, you can see that it's in contact with the inferior vena cava anteromedially, and then over here, it's in, on the anterolateral side, it would be in contact with the liver. The left suprarenal gland is more crescent-shaped, and again, it comes in contact with the pancreas and the stomach and the spleen. Um, looking over here, you can see the cadaver image. So we see the kidneys right here and right here. And then highlighted in pink are the suprarenal glands. So the right suprarenal gland, you can see is in contact with the inferior vena cava. That's this large kind of bluish vessel that you see right here. And the inferior vena cava is slightly anterior to the gland and medial to the gland. And then laterally, we see the liver. Over here with the left suprarenal gland, um, you can see the spleen over here. That's really all we can make out. The um, stomach and the pancreas have been removed so that we can get a clear view. Uh, this vessel that you see right here is the abdominal aorta, which is closer to the left suprarenal gland and then the inferior vena cava is closer to the right. Arterial supply to the kidneys is via the renal arteries. The right renal artery and the left renal artery both originate at the abdominal aorta. And they originally originate at the abdominal aorta at the level of the intervertebral disc that's between the L1 and L2 vertebrae. The renal arteries continue from the abdominal aorta in towards the hilum of the kidney or that, that indentated um, opening of the kidney. The right renal artery is longer than the left. And we see that the right renal artery passes posterior to the inferior vena cava as it heads in towards the right kidney. When we look at the right and left renal artery, 
you can see that the right renal artery is longer because it's starting to the left of midline, right? If you imagine that this is the midline of the body, right between the inferior vena cava and the abdominal aorta. The arteries are coming from the aorta towards the kidneys. So the arteries are starting just to the left of midline. Since we're already starting on the left, we don't have to go very far to get to the left kidney. So the left renal artery is relatively short, but we have to go further to get all the way over to the right kidney. So that's why the right renal artery is longer. And again, we have to go past the inferior vena cava as we get over there to the right kidney. Um, and we see that the right renal artery passes inferior um, or sorry, posterior or behind the inferior vena cava. About 25% of people have variations in either the number or position of the renal vessels. Um, if somebody has an additional or extra vessel, this is referred to as an accessory. renal artery or an accessory renal vein. Again, the variations don't have to be a number though. They don't necessarily have to have an accessory vessel. It might just be a variation in the position of the vessel. The renal arteries divide into five segmental arteries near the hilum of each kidney. The segmental arteries each deliver blood to one segment of the kidney. So coming up soon, I'll show you the five different segments that are present in each of the kidneys. So looking at this, you can see the renal artery, and then it divides and gives us different segmental arteries. The segmental arteries give way to interlober arteries, the interlobar arteries proceed up in between each of the renal pyramids. These are the interlobar arteries. Once we get to the distal portion um, of the renal pyramids, the interlobar arteries become arcuate arteries. These arcuate arteries arc or curve around the distal portions of the renal pyramids. Finally, off of those arcuate arteries, there are interlobular arteries. And the interlobular arteries, or they're also called cortical radiate arteries, radiate out around the renal cortex, which is this outer region. So notice we have interlobar arteries and interlobular arteries. And a lobe is bigger than a lobule. So these lobar arteries are the larger initial ones, and then the lobular arteries are the tiny little ones out here in the cortex. And the whole point of this blood flow, um, or the whole point of these vessels, is to get the blood out here to the renal cortex, because that's where the nephrons are. That's where we actually filter the blood to produce the urine. Venous drainage from the kidney is more variable, um, but the veins follow roughly the same configuration as they make their way back out of the kidney. Okay, so interlobular veins, arcuate veins, interlobar veins, um, and eventually we leave the kidney with renal veins, which you see right here. Um, renal veins end up draining blood into the inferior vena cava. Um, the renal veins are located anterior to the arteries, as you see right here. And as the left renal vein passes towards the inferior vena cava, we see that it passes anterior to the aorta. Because the aorta is located more on the right side of the body, this left renal vein is a little bit longer than the right right? as it traverses over the midline and over the aorta in order to get to the inferior vena cava. The right renal vein can be shorter 
because it's already on the side um, of the inferior vena cava. So each kidney has five segments, each of which has its own segmental artery that delivers blood to it. Um, over here, you can see each of the segments is color coded and then the numbers are associated um, with their specific segmental artery in this picture on the far right. <clears throat> in yellow here, where the number one is, this is referring to the apical segment or superior segment. And then number two, this pink on the bottom, is the caudal segment or inferior segment. When we look at the front of the kidney, the front is broken up into two more regions. The one on the top is the upper anterior, or it's also called the anterior superior. And then just below that, where the number four is, that's referred to as the anterior inferior. So this number four over here, cross out this middle. It's the anterior inferior. The posterior portion of the kidney is its own segment. So over here, you see the posterior segment. Looking at the segmental branches then, this is the superior segmental artery where number one is. And then down here, number two is the inferior segmental artery. Three over here is the anterior superior segmental artery. And then four is the anterior inferior segmental artery. And then five, you can just see the very beginning of it as it heads towards the back. That is the posterior segmental artery. Here we see blood supply to the adrenal glands or the suprarenal glands. The suprarenal glands, remember, have an endocrine function and endocrine glands release hormones into the bloodstream. So the suprarenal glands have a, um, an abundant blood supply. There's a great arterial supply going into the glands. There are between six and eight superior suprarenal arteries that arise from the inferior phrenic artery. Um, here, these are the inferior phrenic arteries. They're the first tiny little branch off of the abdominal aorta, or sometimes they can come from the celiac trunk as well. Here we see the inferior phrenic arteries that will go to the inferior side of the diaphragm. And then all of these little branches right here are superior suprarenal arteries. Again, there are numerous branches. The middle suprarenal arteries also arise from the abdominal aorta. They're just more inferior. The middle suprarenal arteries come very close to the superior mesenteric artery. So here, this is showing us the superior mesenteric artery. And then just lateral to that, you can see where the middle suprarenal artery arises. Um, and there can be one or more middle suprarenal arteries. Um, same goes for the inferior suprarenal arteries. There can be one or there can be more. The inferior suprarenal arteries arise from the renal artery. From the renal artery, which you see right here. Um, venous drainage is into one single large suprarenal vein. The right suprarenal vein drains right into the inferior vena cava which you can see right here. The left suprarenal vein drains into the left renal vein, and then the left renal vein drains into the inferior vena cava. Remember, the inferior vena cava is right along the, um, the border of the right suprarenal gland. So the right suprarenal gland, the blood doesn't have to go very far to get to the inferior vena cava. So this right suprarenal vein just hops right over to the inferior vena cava. The left suprarenal gland is further away. So this vein merges in 
to the renal vein, and then the renal vein crosses over into the inferior vena cava. When locating the kidneys um, from the outside, we locate them in accordance to or compared to the transpyloric plane, which passes through each of the kidneys just at different levels. The transpyloric plane is a horizontal plane that crosses through the body at the level of the T12 spinous process. This transpyloric plane crosses through the superior border of the hilum, so just the very top of the hilum of the left kidney. And the hilum is about five centimeters to the left of the median plane at the level of the T12 spinous process. The transpyloric plane passes through the superior pole of the right kidney. So it's passing through the top of the right kidney because remember, the right kidney is located about 2.5 centimeters lower than the left kidney. The superior parts of the kidneys generally lie deep to the 11th and 12th ribs posteriorly. Um, they do move slightly, however, with respiration. So when we inhale and exhale, the kidneys do move slightly and with changes in position from standing erect and then laying supine. The kidneys are generally impalpable. They're generally not easy to feel. Um, the inferior most pole of the right kidney may be felt with deep bimanual examination of a lean patient. In this case, the inferior pole of the kidney will be felt as a firm and smooth, kind of rounded mass. And that mass you'll feel descend on inspiration. So when the patient inhales and the diaphragm descends, that lowers the kidney slightly. The Left kidney, however, is typically not palpable um, unless it's enlarged or displaced. Here you can see the location of the kidneys. Um, remember, you're looking at this from the back, so your left and right are the same as the patient's left and right. Um, so you can see over here on the right that the right kidney is slightly lower than the left kidney. You can see that the superior parts of the kidney are just deep to the 11th and the 12th ribs. Um, also, you can see if we draw a line through the transpyloric plane at the 12th spinous process, you can see it goes up through the top of the hilum of the left kidney and then it just passes through the superior pole of the right kidney. A renal transplant is now an accepted treatment for very specific or select cases of advanced renal failure. When renal transplantation is done, the kidney is typically not placed in the original position. Um, instead, the kidney is placed more inferior down in the iliac fossa. The iliac fossa is this depression that's present in the ilium, right, or around this side. So the kidney is actually um, placed down in the greater pelvis as opposed to in the abdomen. Um, this puts the kidney a lot closer to the bladder than its original position. When the kidney is placed so close to the bladder, that shortens the lengths of renal vessels that are needed and the lengths of ureter that are required in order to access the bladder. 
the renal artery and renal vein are reconnected into the external iliac artery and the external iliac vein. Um, the external iliac artery and vein are right out here. Sorry. They are right out in this region right here and right here. So looking at this, this is the abdominal aorta. It bifurcates into the common iliac artery. That bifurcates into the internal iliac and the external iliac. And the external iliac artery continues all the way down until it exits into the leg. So the um, renal artery is connected to this external iliac artery, and then the renal vein is connected to the external iliac vein. And then the ureter is sutured into the urinary bladder, which you see located right here in the center. A renal calculus is what we would typically refer to as a kidney stone. Um, kidney stones are hard masses that can develop anywhere um, in the kidney or the ureter or the bladder. They generally contain a lot of um, calcium salts and they're painful. Um, the renal calculus can cause either complete or intermittent obstruction of urinary flow, um, typically through the ureter. And this can result in excessive distension of the ureter, which is painful. Um, it's a common cause of ureteric colic. Ureteric colic is just severe, intermittent, pain of the ureter. Um, this occurs as the kidney stone is forced down the ureter by the waves of contraction that typically will just be propelling urine down the ureter. Pain from ureteric colic um, is typically referred to other areas that are innervated by the spinal cord segments and sensory ganglia that typically supply the ureter. So this would be spinal cord segments T11 through L2. Pain from renal calculus or ureteric colic can be referred to the lumbar region, the inguinal region, the anterior proximal thigh, and this is really, really proximal on the very, very top of the thigh, and then also the external genitalia. Renal calculi or kidney stones typically pass without any surgical or medical intervention. However, if they're too large or there are too many of them to pass on their own, then we can have surgery or some sort of medical intervention to help remove them or break them up so that they're easier to pass. A nephro nephroscope is a tool that we utilize to visualize um, the kidney or the ureter and then also to remove the stones. Um, this is showing us a percutaneous nephrolithotomy. Um, this is when the scope is going through the skin and subcutaneous tissue and into the kidney. There are also ways to access the ureters via the urethra. Over here, we see a procedure referred to as lithotripsy. Um, lithotripsy is a more non-invasive procedure where shock waves um, are sent through the body in the region of the kidneys and the shock waves break up the kidney stones into smaller fragments. Um, these smaller fragments can then be passed um, without blocking the ureters or um, causing obstruction. And this is what you see here. This is the machine. Um, and then again, the shock waves just literally break up the kidney stone without having to gain access to the kidneys or the bladder or the urethra or the ureters.
The peritoneum um, presents a location that we can utilize for the administration of drugs. The peritoneum is a semi-permeable membrane. It has a very large surface area and it's highly vascular. It has numerous capillary beds present. So um, fluid that gets injected into the peritoneal cavity is rapidly absorbed. Um, again, we can use this as a means to administer drugs. Um, we do this with, for example, barbiturates. used as anesthetics. Peritoneal dialysis um, is another procedure that we can do that's related to the peritoneum. Um, in peritoneal dialysis, we are removing wastes and toxins from the blood like the kidney would typically do um, in a patient with renal failure. So in renal failure, the kidneys are no longer filtering wastes out of the blood, so those wastes build up. Um, dialysis allows us to remove those wastes from the bloodstream. Peritoneal dialysis can be performed just for short periods of time in patients with renal failure. For a long-term therapy, um, we utilize a dialysis machine that accepts direct blood flow from the patient. With peritoneal dialysis, a dilute sterile solution is introduced into the peritoneal cavity. Um, then diffusion occurs between that fluid and the blood that's flowing through all of the vast capillary beds. So there's diffusion um, of solutes and fluid and um, all of the wastes that are present between the blood and the peritoneal cavity. Again, this is just according to concentration gradients. Now, if there are a bunch of wastes um, that have built up in the bloodstream and we just secreted um, or we just inserted a solution that's very dilute, that means that those wastes are going to cross from high concentration in the blood to low concentration in the peritoneum. Right? So by injecting a dilute solution, we're pulling solutes and fluid from the bloodstream into the peritoneum. Um, then that fluid that contains wastes and excess ions is then drained from the peritoneum. Again, this is um, only used for short periods of time. It's not a means to completely replace direct dialysis with a dialysis machine. Here you can see um, a demonstration of peritoneal dialysis. So out here, this line is the parietal peritoneum. And then remember the visceral peritoneum is on the surface of the organs. So this space where you see the blue fluid, that's the actual peritoneal space or the peritoneal cavity. Um, here you can see we have a bag of this sterile and dilute fluid and we fill the peritoneal cavity with the fluid. Over time, just the diffusion, um, wastes and solutes exit the blood via all of the capillary beds and enter into the solution. And then the solution is drained from the body. And there we have all the wastes that were pulled out of the bloodstream. Again, trying to mimic the activity of the kidney because in renal failure, the kidney is not functioning properly as a filter. Embryonic division of tissue can result in bifurcation and duplication of the ureter and the renal pelvis and sometimes a kidney as well. Um, this can be unilateral or bilateral and it is fairly common to see um, at least bifid ureter. The um, bifurcation of the renal pelvis and the ureter typically occurs um, proximally 
but the ureters will merge and it's um, rare to have separate openings into the bladder. Typically the ureters will merge before that and just have one opening into the bladder. The extent of um, bifurcation depends on the completeness of the division of tissue in the embryo. If there's incomplete division, then you just end up with, we end up with a bifid ureter where there's two renal pelvises and ureters, um, but not two actual separate kidneys. If there's a complete division of the embryonic tissue, then there's a supernumerary, um, supernumerary kidney, an extra actual kidney that's present, which you can see up here. You see the additional kidney, Okay, and the ureters, the ureters merge, and then there's one entry into the bladder. And then the other side is normal. Here you can see this. Um, this side looks okay, but over on this side, you can see there's the one renal pelvis coming down to a ureter, and then another renal pelvis coming down to a ureter. So here's the bifurcation. The kidneys are really close together in the embryo during development, and the inferior poles of the kidney can fuse to each other, so the two kidneys actually get fused and become one. Um, this happens in one in 600 fetuses. Um, very rarely it could be the superior poles that fuse, um, but almost all the time it's actually the inferior poles, and that ends up creating kind of a like U-shaped kidney where the two connect at the inferior pole. Um, this is why it's called horseshoe kidney. Um, the kidney isn't able or the kidneys aren't able to rise to their normal position because they're blocked by the um, inferior mesenteric artery. So the kidneys end up lying at the level of L3 to L5. Um, again, that's lower than normal. And that's because their ascent is blocked by the inferior mesenteric artery. Um, usually, a horseshoe kidney is asymptomatic. Um, it possibly there can be structural abnormalities that are associated with it, and then if those um, associated abnormalities exist, it can be so it can um, lead to ureteral uh, obstruction. But typically, it's asymptomatic. An ectopic pelvic kidney is uncommon, but it's important to be aware of in case you see it on imaging. You don't want to think that the ectopic kidney. Um, is a pelvic tumor and remove it. So an ectopic pelvic kidney is when one or both kidneys fail to ascend up to the abdomen. The kidney ends up lying um, anterior to the sacrum, typically. So down in the sacrum, the, the, the pelvis, you see a, a, a mass, and people can mistake that for a pelvic tumor. But again, that's just an ectopic pelvic kidney. So if you don't see the kidneys in their typical place, um, that's important to consider. So these are showing us horseshoe kidney. Um, again, the inferior pole of the kidney has fused, and we have this U-shaped kidney as a result. And again, here you see the same thing. And here you can see the two poles of the kidney. And again, it's down lower than it typically would be. Over here, you can see that there's an ectopic kidney down here in the pelvis. Right? This kidney is in its usual place, um, but down here, this is much lower than it should be down in the pelvis. Pain from the abdominal viscera 
um, is poorly localized and is often referred to the dermatome level that receives sensory fibers um, from the nerve that goes to that organ. So here you see um, common sites of referred pain from the abdominal pelvic viscera. When there's irritation in the liver, um, gallbladder, or duodenum, that can often also irritate the diaphragm. And irritation of the diaphragm causes referred pain in the neck um, and back, kind of towards the shoulder region, which you see here in orange. Um, the spleen is relatively localized um, here in the left abdomen or left kind of side of the abdomen around to the back. The appendix, you see we talked about this here in the, um, in the belly, that the appendix pain typically begins as umbilical pain and then it progresses down to the um, right lower quadrant. Pain from the kidneys and your readers, we just mentioned, and we said that that pain can go from the um, external genitalia through the inguinal region, which is right here in this um, inguinal crease, and then it can wrap around to the um, flank or lumbar region, which you see back here. Pain from the liver can um, be referred, we said, up to the kind of neck and back, but then it also does wrap around right where the liver is in the upper right quadrant, and then down around to the back and lumbar region. Gallbladder is typically just above that, um, and then wrapping around to the back and up towards the scapula. Um, stomach pain can be pretty well localized around the anterior or ventral side of the body. Then also stomach pain can um, be referred back in between the scapula. Okay, the last major thing that we'll cover in the lecture is the diaphragm. The diaphragm is a musculotendinous partition that forms almost a complete barrier between the thoracic cavity superiorly and the abdominal cavity inferiorly. <clears throat> the border of the diaphragm is fixed to the inferior margin of the thoracic cage, uh, laterally and anteriorly, and then posteriorly, it's connected to the superior lumbar vertebrae. The central region of the diaphragm descends down into the abdominal cavity during inspiration. Um, however, the lateral borders are connected, so they don't move, they do not descend. It's just the central region that descends and then ascends, descends and ascends during respiration. The diaphragm curves superiorly on either side of a central tendon that's located in the middle of the diaphragm and the curves that go superiorly up towards the thoracic cavity are referred to as the right dome and the left dome. The right dome is slightly higher than the left and that's because of the liver located just inferior to the diaphragm on the right side. The level of the um, domes of the diaphragm vary according to the phase of the respiratory cycle, um, according to the position, whether the person is lay, um, standing erect or lying in a supine position, as well as the size of the abdominal viscera. Here we're looking at the inferior surface of the diaphragm. Um, you can see that there are multiple passageways present in the diaphragm where structures pass from the thoracic cavity down into the abdominal cavity. Um, this opening right here is the caval opening. That's where the inferior vena cava um, passes down into the abdominal cavity. This opening right here is the esophageal hiatus. This is where the esophagus passes down into the abdominal cavity, and then also the anterior and posterior 
vagal trunks. The aortic hiatus is actually located posterior to the diaphragm. So the um, aorta is not going through the diaphragm. The aorta passes just posterior to the diaphragm. Um, also, I didn't tell you guys here, when you look at the esophageal hiatus, notice this, um, the right crura. That's this band of muscle right here that comes and wraps around the esophagus at the esophageal hiatus. Um, that right crura where it wraps around the esophagus, that forms the lower esophageal sphincter that we talked about before, which remember forms um, a nice tight lid on top of the stomach to prevent gastric contents from washing up into the esophagus. Um, all right, so looking down at the aortic hiatus. Again, that's where the aorta passes back behind the diaphragm. And that's also where the azygous vein and the thoracic duct pass between the abdomen and the thoracic cavity. Um, you'll notice this little uh, ligament that passes just in front of the aorta. This ligament right here, this little like, light line that passes through right there is the median arcuate ligament. Okay, so just in front of the aortic hiatus is the median arcuate ligament. We also have a medial arcuate ligament here and here. Um, and that's just by the passageway where the psoas major passes. And then the lateral arcuate ligament we have on either side here and here where the quadratus passes through. Looking at the diaphragm, the diaphragm is broken up into four parts. Um, the sternal part of the diaphragm, you see present here just um, behind the sternum. So the sternal part attaches to the posterior xiphoid process right here. There are two costal parts, so a right costal part and a left costal part. Um, these attach to the internal part of the inferior six costal cartilages and their ribs. So you can see connecting to the costal cartilages and ribs, hence being called costal. And then the lumbar part attaches to the first three lumbar vertebrae. Um, and then also the medial and lateral arcuate ligaments that we just saw right here. Motor supply to the diaphragm is um, completely via the left and right phrenic nerves. And each of the phrenic nerves supplies half of the diaphragm. Um, the phrenic nerves are derived from the anterior rami of the C3 through C5 spinal cord segments. Um, the phrenic nerves also supply most of the sensory fibers to the diaphragm. Um, just the lateral portions or edges of the diaphragm um, the sensory input comes from the intercostal and subcostal nerves. But again, most of the diaphragm sensory input is from um, the left and right phrenic nerves as well, just like motor input. Arterial supply to the diaphragm differs um, on the superior diaphragm versus the inferior diaphragm. The superior diaphragm is supplied by the paracardiophrenic and musculophrenic arteries 
as well as the superior phrenic arteries. The inferior surface of the diaphragm is supplied by the inferior phrenic arteries. And then venous drainage is the same. Um, the superior surface is drained by the pericardiocophrenic and musculophrenic oops, veins. And the superior phrenic vein. And the inferior surface is drained by the inferior phrenic veins. Um, here you guys see some of that. Over here, these are showing you the phrenic nerves. Um, so the phrenic nerves extend down around the pericardium, and then you can see innervating the, um, the diaphragm, and then same thing over on this side. Right, and then innervating this half of the diaphragm. Um, section of the phrenic nerve, um, so if either phrenic nerve is severed, that's going to result in paralysis of that half of the diaphragm. Remember, the phrenic nerves provide complete motor innervation to the diaphragm. Um, so if we sever this nerve, that would be paralysis of this half of the diaphragm. And that's referred to as paralysis of a hemi diaphragm. So that would result in a, um, a wasting of that half of the diaphragm, and then that half of the diaphragm would have paradoxical movements during respiration. So the one half of the diaphragm will move appropriately during respiration, but then the paralyzed half will move in the opposite direction. Um, here we're looking at the inferior surface of the diaphragm. So you can see um, that we're looking at the inferior phrenic arteries. Um, so this is the abdominal aorta right here, and then coming from it we have um, the inferior phrenic artery on either side, going and branching out all around the inferior portions of the, di of the diaphragm. Pain from the diaphragm um, radiates to different areas based on the sensory nerve fiber distribution to that part of the diaphragm. Um, pain from the diaphragmatic pleura or peritoneum, so the, the major kind of central regions of the diaphragm, typically radiates to the shoulder area. That's because that's the area that's supplied by the C3 through C5 spinal cord segments, which also supply the phrenic nerve. And the phrenic nerve also provides sensory fibers to the central portions of the diaphragm. Pain from the peripheral regions of the um, diaphragm is more localized to the skin over the costal margins and the anterolateral abdominal wall. Um, the reason for that is that this peripheral regions of the diaphragm are supplied by sensory fibers from the inferior intercostal nerves, which also supply the skin over the costal margins and the abdomen, the abdominal wall. Rupture of the diaphragm and then a resultant herniation of the viscera up into the thoracic cavity can happen as a result of large sudden increases in intrathoracic pressure or intra-abdominal pressure. Most commonly, this is a result of severe injury that's associated with the motor vehicle accident. Almost all the time, over 95% of the time, this occurs on the left side of the diaphragm. Um, the reason is that the liver is on the right, and the liver provides a good barrier um, between the diaphragm and the source of the pressure in the abdomen. 
A traumatic diaphragmatic hernia can occur when um, any part of the stomach, small intestine, the mesentery, the transverse colon or spleen herniates up through the diaphragm and into the thorax through what's referred to as the lumbocostal triangle. The lumbocostal triangle is an area in the posterior lateral portion of the diaphragm back um, or between the lumbar region of the diaphragm and the costal portion of the diaphragm. And it's a little kind of triangular shaped region that is non-muscular. Um, it's just kind of membranous, so it's not as strong and a large increase in pressure can cause rupture of the lumbocostal triangle. Um, when that ruptures, then due to the pressure, parts of the visceral and the abdomen can get pushed through or herniated up into the thorax. Congenital diaphragmatic hernia is a birth defect that affects the diaphragm um, that occurs again in that lumbocostal triangle area. Um, the stomach and intestine herniate up through that um, posterior lateral defect. That defect in the lumbocostal triangle is referred to as the foramen of Bochtelek. Uh, herniation, again, is typically on the left side because on the right, the liver provides a good barrier. When this happens in the, when this happens in a fetus during development or in a neonate, um, the abdominal contents of the abdomen pass up through the herniated defect or pass up through the defect into the thoracic cavity and this encroaches upon the space, the pleural cavity, that the lung would typically have to grow and develop. So if the lung is not able to develop and the neonate is born without um, a fully functioning developed lung. Um, this typically occurs in one in every about 2,200 infants, so 2,200 infants, and it has an extremely high mortality rate, about 76% mortality due to respiratory failure.